You're about to see what's on my screen. Yes, yes, yes. There we go. We are streaming. All right. I am jacking around with OBS um, studio mode. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I need. Also, making scenes like I have the live scene with all my stuff on it. But also, now I can have a wait screen instead of like compiling it all on the same scene. And you guys who you guys know who uh, what OBS is and how it works and stuff. You guys are like, yeah, duh, we already knew that. So like now I have a wait screen scene, and I have the working scene, which you're seeing right now. But transitioning out of that, like, it was kind of like a little bit difficult for me. So there's a lot of hiccups and stuff. But my name is Joseph Louthan. Welcome to. Uh, another episode of the Bible study, uh, in Romans, but here's the thing. Okay. So I did my first, first, I would say the first official Bible study, uh, episode last Monday at noon and we're a little bit delayed. Uh, I had a work thing come up, so I couldn't do it right at lunch. And, uh, and I was just chomping it at the bit all week. And so, like, I have, if you have visited my website, if you visited my blog, I have a lot of material that I've written over the last 12, 13 years. And, uh, and I was like, hey, some of these can, I can put these into a series. Uh, I can stream these. These are no big deal. So it came up. I have a lot. But what I did was trying to pace myself because I have the, that personality that wants to do like one every day. And streaming is a lot of fun. I love it so much. I've tried doing, like I said, I tried doing podcasts, definitely tried my hand at YouTube. It's just like you're recording it and you're worrying about the editing. What I love about this is like literally like I'm going to stop record. Like you're watching this. I'm going to stop recording. I'm going to process the video, just shoot it up to YouTube. I'm going to process the audio in GarageBand, may add some bumpers and stuff like that, and just po post it, be on my way, way, don't care, move on the rest, rest, rest of my life. Now, here's the thing. So, I came up with three series. So, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So, uh, while I need to bring up, actually, I need to bring up, um, I, I don't know if you caught that wait screen, but here are some of the graphics that we're talking about. So I can do a image slideshow. I'm going to go ahead and put that banner back up. And and we let's talk about it because All right, here we go. So Mondays at noon central, we're going to do live stream the Bible study of epistles to the Romans. That's why you're here. No big deal. That's this is information you already know. Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Central will be the meditations on the pastoral epistles. This is my most difficult writing thus far. And and I know these are moving really, really quick. I should pro probably pause these. Um, uh, this is... I was challenged by... Here's a story behind that. I was challenged by my um, mentor who it's like, you know, let's do a Bible study. Let's go through the pastoral epistles. And so I want to be prepared. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And so I, I call these meditations because it's like a reflection on or a thought on the pastoral epistles. Why? And we're talking about pastoral epistles. We're talking about the letters of Paul to Timothy and Titus. So that's where we get the books, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Why we call them pastoral epistles? Because it is a um, it is a letter on how to do church ministry, or a, a more fancier term than that would be your philosophy of ministry. So philosophy is why you think the way you think. So put that all together. Why do you think the way you think on ministry? Why do you do the things that you do in ministry? And you may be listening to this and be like, yeah, duh. You know, it's like Great Commission. Yeah, duh. It's uh, preaching gospel or, you know, trying to get people to live their best life. Now, all of those are philosophy of ministries. You just don't kind of realize it. And that you're, you're going to hear me rant about philosophy all the time. And today will not be that exception. Philosophy, we are all influenced by the philosophy of our day 
right now we're in modern and postmodern. Uh, and a lot of people, most, most people don't realize they think the way they think because of the time period they lived in. Some actually go to college, read the books, and they'll embrace a philosophy. That's where you get like humanism or, um, uh, uh, now I'm just going completely blank, uh, prag pragmatism or any of that, those isms that you, some people embrace those, even though each of those isms don't actually work out. They don't, they don't like, they don't make you happy. They don't like get you to a higher level or anything like that. Only the gospel does that. Um, so it's kind of weird, you know, like when you don't, we don't have God, you have to, you have to like grab onto something else. And a lot of times, uh, a lot of people do that. Uh, but again, 99 or excuse me, 90% of the people in the world, they just don't realize they're being influenced by, uh, the, they're, they're thinking, they think the way they think because of the world at large. And Paul himself said, uh, don't your, your, your thinking needs to be, uh, uh, your mind has to be set on Christ. Your mind has to be set on the spirit. Your, um, yeah, don't just don't, uh, capture your thoughts and put them on Christ. So maybe you have that. Uh, so I'm going to go into that. And it's also like, we're, I'm talking about philosophy of ministry. Well, this, uh, the meditations on the, on first and second Timothy and Titus, was a big reason why I left my last church or we transitioned from my last church to the church that we're currently at now. Again, nothing that my former church, and I'll leave them unnamed, uh, they did something wrong or sinful or heresy. None of that. It was none of that. It was a difference in philosophy of ministry. That's all it was. And so uh, when I engaged the scriptures about that, I was like, oh, I this is the reason why I do ministry. These are the reasons why let me find a church that like will line up with that. And the, the fruit is amazing. So, uh, but we'll talk more about that. We'll talk about more on Wednesdays at 5 PM central. So, uh, check that out. And last but not least, uh, probably my favorite, favorite subject in the world, uh, family devotions about, I'm going to give you this backstory about, Man, uh, 2012. So several, several years ago, like nine years ago, um, uh, I was, uh, leading devotions, uh, for a bunch of kids and it was just like, like I felt like in that moment, um, like just raising these kids and these are actually, let me kind of put some context there. It was actually my stepkids and it was actually in a previous marriage and I, um, I was like, I've got to, you know, these are kids or they are stepkids. Uh, how do I, how do I run? How do I lead my household? Well, well, the only thing I knew how to do is point them to God and point them to Christ. Well, for me, the easiest way to do that two ways, one live your life out. And two is an explicit teaching of the Bible, continuously bringing up the Bible and I felt no better way of doing that, but then just to gather once a week around the dinner table and just walking through a gospel, walking through maybe Galatians or Ephesians, walking through Genesis, um, the sky's the limit. And so I noticed that a lot of pa parents don't do that. A lot of Christian parents don't do that uh, for whatever reason. And I was hoping to write a, a series of devotions that kind of like, don't worry about it. It, it's easier than you think it is, but it's going to be okay. And I just want to help out, you know, just like if you had any questions or thoughts or comments, just let me know. And, uh, what that produced was not only that I complete the teaching on the gospel of Mark, but also complete the writings on the gospel of Luke. And I just started the gospel of, uh, Matthew. And coincidentally, not coincidentally, I started this. I started these family devotions up again with my son, my oldest son, who now lives with me. Uh, he's college age; he's about to start college, but he lives at home. And I was like, "And hey, you know what?" And he he was he was um, he was from a previous marriage, so I'm giving you a lot of like personal background. 
Um, but he uh, did not live with me until just real recently. So I was like, you know what? Start fired up all over again. Um, this is what I'm called to do. And I'm going to let lead lead accordingly to my own conscience, to my convictions, to what I see in the word. And it'll be by God's grace alone. So, um, look forward to that. That's Fridays at 5 PM central. Those, those will be live. Of course, if you miss it, you know, these are weird times and I understand, and I'll probably get into why I do it at those times, but you have, um, uh, it's mostly around because of supper time, but, um, these, these will be posted to YouTube later that evening. And, and then a little bit later on, they'll be posted to podcasts. It's just a matter of like getting the files out there and all that stuff. So, all right. Now that you've been completely up to date, set your schedule, follow this channel, set your schedule Mondays noon. I know it's a weird time. Mondays at noon central Wednesdays, first, second Timothy and Titus. That will be Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Central. Fridays, 5 p.m. Central, will be Family Devotions and the Gospel of Mark. All right. So, other than that, I have no other... I don't think I have any other announcements, per se. Um, let me think about this. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So... Obviously, I don't have any really, I, I love doing resources like what are the resources I use in order to prepare for this series? And so I do have a resource page for Mark, not necessarily for First and Second Timothy and Titus. I might post something later, but I'm just really, those are meditations. I wouldn't call them a study. I wouldn't call them like a commentary or anything like that. But devotions, I had some resources at hand and I updated it for 2021. Uh, I might do a one-off, like, uh, what do you call that? A one-off episode uh, talking about the Mark resources, but it's not required viewing. When I when we get to Wednesday, when I get to Friday of this week, I want to just start into it like 1 Timothy 1-1 one, one through 11 or Friday. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Just hit it. That's You don't need to hear about me, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm doing right now, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, just let's get to the work, right? So enough of that. Let's get to the work. Okay. Um, today we're going to do, uh, the study Romans one verses one through seven. Oh, it's a, it's a doozy. And so, and also like you're hearing this, I have a live, it's not live. It's in real life home study every Sunday in Norman at 7 p.m. Sunday, Sunday evening, right? So this, what we did, what we're doing today, we did last week, like eight days ago, okay? So I do it, you know, for my real life Bible study, and then I am able to meditate, kind of, if there's any corrections, they're like, what did I write that for? I can correct, and I was like, oh, I was I misspoke there or whatever, and just kind of work that out. Also, it's not, the Bible study is not about me. In this stream, you're hearing me, like, it's almost like a monologue, right? Like, it's me talking to you guys. You can chat, but it's not really a dialogue, and that's where I really, really love the live at home Bible study, or I keep calling it live, the in real life Bible study, because it's a dialogue, you know? I pepper it with questions. I make sure that I'm not the one speaking the most and stuff like that. You know, you're not here to come hear me teach or anything. That's It's not a classroom. It's a Bible study. It's a let's get together and kind of just hash this out. The format's the same. The show notes, the, the episode notes, what I call them episode notes or show notes, the notes that I use for that Bible studies are exactly the same. I read it from this. So uh, you're not missing anything. So anywho. Let's talk about this. Let's go. Uh, Romans 1, verses 1 through 7, certain chapter, or excuse me, start at verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David, according. Oh my gosh. Okay. According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith 
for the sake of his name among the Gentiles, all the Gentiles, including you who are also called by Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's walk through this. This is a heck of an introduction. Mm. So Paul, we, we in the last episode, we talked about, and checking my posture, because I have really bad posture. Um, Paul, in the last episode, we talked everything about Paul. We, we, we talked about a little bit about his life, but we talked about his conversion to Christ and what that meant and the ramifications of that conversion. I'm going to say this, like everybody's like, you know, I had a Damascus type conversion or I didn't, right? Let me tell you something. If you are saved by God, to God, for God, when you are saved by God, the 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 ramifications, the fruit of that is dramatic. I'm going to say it's just dramatic. It, it wasn't like, oh yeah, I, I'm saved and my life got a little bit better. You know? No, 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 no. It's a, it's a binary. It's ones and zeros. It's like a flip of the switch. It's like lit. Listen, uh, uh, first John, uh, uh, First John five one. Let me look that up because I want you. I want you guys to read this. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Read this with me. This is this is just coming out like. Why? Why am I mentioning this, right? Everyone who believes that Christ, Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. And you're like, okay, so what? Look at this. Here's here is the 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 thing that you have to like put your mind, wrap your mind around that. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And that's in the NIV. Let me switch that, which is a good. Translation, everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God. You're like, okay, so yeah, so what? You know what? You were, you were spiritually dead. Let me put it another way. You were actually dead before you met Christ. Okay? You're like, well, that's dramatic. Also, I'm living. Okay, so you, you're, are you trying to tell me that you base your life, the way you're living or not living, is based on the fact that you can breathe air, you can think thoughts, you can blood rushes through your veins and your heart pumps and all that stuff. That's how you would define life. Well, God would define life by the his spirit in you. And we're about to get to that 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 bifurcation, that cutting of the two, the black and white. If you're in the flesh, it leads to death. If you are uh, in the spirit, it leads to life. You're actually alive. And I was like, I don't think I'm far off from this because uh, Paul also says at the beginning of Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Because we were once born of Adam, all humans are born of Adam, they were all born to die. But Christ came to give a life. And I say that to say, Everybody had I everybody has a Damascus road type conversion. Because your life, I, whether the, your circumstances changed or whatever, that's that's neither here nor there. But the way you thought, the way you think, the way you love, the way you do, what you do completely and i would say if you look back at what god did it's dramatic it's dramatic uh, i would i i'm not here to like definitely not here to judge your salvation or question your salvation but i would go to god it's like if you don't feel like your life completely changed after you say yes i follow christ let me go get baptized and stuff like that but it has not dramatically changed like the what you thought if you were younger, I will put it this way. If you were younger when you got saved, praise be to God. If you're older and that switch, but the way you thought and you didn't really struggle with sin, I would go to God about that. Let let the Holy Spirit answer that for you. So, serving to Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, 
Um, this reminds me of one of the greatest uh, thanks uh, prayers or the greatest thanksgivings in the Bible. Uh, I memorized this and I uh, would encourage you to memorize this too. Have you ever heard of the term chief of sinners? This is where this comes from. So let me flip this off. I always forget to flip it off for some reason. There we go. So in first Timothy one twelve, Hey, not this week, but next week we'll, uh, dive into that. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent opponent. That's a violent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with a faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That sets the stage. Like, what was Paul called to do? What are we called to do? We're about to find out. We're about to dig through Romans. Well, we got to set the stage. We've got to say where we came from and where we're going. And if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't know if I believe. I don't know if I trust God. I don't know if I obey God. Hey, you know what? Just sit tight. We're going to walk through that. Why do I need God? Sit tight. We're going to go through all that. Okay. So going on, he, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, this is the old Testament. This is Luke 24. This is the, uh, the road, uh, to Emmaus with the disciples, um, in the beginning was with Moses and all the prophets. He interpreted them, the things concerning himself and all the scriptures, the old Testament points to Jesus Christ. If the Old Testament, if you try to get the Old Testament to talk about not Jesus Christ, you're you're going to go off the rails. Just like, you know, like, what is this about? What? Why are we sacrificing doves in Leviticus? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Talk, go through the prophets. I want to challenge you. You want to, you want to talk about like, you want to talk about like, um, a reading challenge? Do this. I didn't listen to me hardcore. You might have to start, you may take a week or so. I want you to start at Isaiah and read and just blow through, just barrel through um, all the prophets up, up until my, uh, Malachi. If you pick up by the power of the Holy Spirit, you pick up what the prophets were prophesying at the end of Malachi. You're like, it, it's 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 the it's what. Paul says in Romans 7, say, who is going to save me from this body of death? And you flip that page, Matthew 1, 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's amazing. It's, a, it's just like an amazing Jesus Christ was that answer for everything in the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. So Matthew 5, 17, he says it himself, don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until the heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not the one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of God. Just because Christ has fulfilled the law and the prophets that doesn't mean we get to not obey God. That doesn't even make sense. And he he goes on. He, he goes. He continues on like he's like I've come to fulfill the law. You don't get to teach people to disobey the law. Does that make sense? Um, but whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Guess what? The scribes and Pharisees were the most holy people. They walked around in holiness. 
but their holiness didn't even stack up. He goes, you, your, your righteousness has to surpass them. It has to be greater than the most holiest people that you've ever heard of in your life. It almost sounds like you're going to have to have a perfect righteousness. It almost sounds like you're going to have to have a godly righteousness. Perhaps a righteousness that's not from us, but it's actually from God. But we're about to get in that. Keep on. Not today. We're going we're gonna to get into it eventually. But stay tuned. All right. I'll keep up with my bookmarks for some reason. Not a thing. Uh, who was a descendant of David? I just mentioned Matthew 1, one, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. In Luke, uh, also mentioned in Luke 3, 23 through 28. This is also because, why is this so important? Was the covenant, it's the promise of God that God had for King David way, 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 way back in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel. Uh, he says, when your time, God says, when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, Actually, I'm going to speak out of turn. I think this is a prophet, uh, but not God. But in any way, the word of God says, when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up after you your descendant, Jesus Christ, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will discipline him with the rod of men and blows from morals. But my faithful love will never leave him as it did when it, I removed it from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. Now, you see this and you're like, okay, when he does wrong, I will disciple or discipline him with the rod of men and blows from mortals. And you're like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought Jesus was perfect. He was perfect. And and in so much, he he this when his the sons of David did go off the rails, and they did. Just keep reading first uh first and second Kings, first and second chronicles, way off the rails, including including especially Solomon. Uh God will discipline him. There's one um Oh, I used to know this like, like off the top of my head. Um, in one of the Corinthians, uh, the uh, the account of King uh, Manasseh, uh, that's exactly what happened to him. He goes all the way into sin and folly and evilness and wickedness. He sacrifices his two sons to a demon. And he was disciplined. And God retrieved him back. And he repented. In Kings, it doesn't say that, but in Chronicles, he uh, King Manasseh repented. But that's neither here nor there. But here's the thing. This is the Fetic Covenant. And Christ bore our sins. He bore, when, he bore our wrongs. And he was disciplined. He was crushed. And it pleases the Father for him to be crushed for our sake, to save us. To save his people from their sins. He did it all. And that was the promise he gave to David. He goes, a descendant of yours is going to sit on my on that throne forever. It wasn't Solomon. It wasn't Manasseh. It wasn't any of those kings that came after him. It was Jesus Christ. According to the flesh. These four words, are they uh, maybe taking a little bit out like ripping it a little bit out of context because like you read it according to the flesh well what does that mean here's what i that i think how god who is jesus christ who is internally god forever the son of god the begotten the begotten son of the father uh in perfect harmony perfect communion perfect love with the father and the spirit for eternity past right but he steps away from that glory and he becomes flesh. So in for in John chapter one, verse fourteen, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have observed his glory. The glory of the only one of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For that to have happened, 
And if all the Old Testament, for all the Old Testament prophecies, what nobody could have gotten right. The, what If you're in the Old Testament and you said, God will make things right, he did. Uh, it will be uh, a descendant of Eve, which you're right. Also a, son, a descendant of David, also right. Uh, all the promises you could jam pack into the uh, the Noah covenant, Abrahamic covenant, uh, all those things, all the promises of God, and just jam packed into the Messiah, born in Bethlehem, or was coming from Bethlehem. All these things, you're like, okay, okay, yeah, I get it. it it's gonna be, it's gonna be a man. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a, a king of some sort, a redeemer of some sort, a Messiah, definitely. And and the, the Israelites had messiahs, they had prophets, they had all these these they had kings, they had all these things that just kind of fell short or a lot short, but they everybody that God sent, all the judges, all that was pointing to one. But what you could not wrap your mind around was that how was God why would God become flesh? Why would God become a man? Why and why would he become a man? And he did so by being born of the Virgin Mary. Why? The, that he had Jesus had to do what every single human failed to do. Live perfectly in perfect obedience to God in his law. He, he had to be the one. And we know this because, and again, we're going to often quote this. We're going to, I'm going to, I know maybe 10 scriptures, and this is one of the second Corinthians five twenty one. Uh, for our sake, he became, God became Jesus became sin who knew no sin so that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of Jesus. That's the reason why. But he had to do so. Only if man commits sin, only man can, only the life of man can be sacrificed in order to redeem that sin. But here's the thing. Our sacrifices don't mean jack. If we die, if we die, that doesn't atone us. If we died, that it's going to be tragic, but it's not going to atone. It's not going to make up for anything. Our our lives are imperfect and filled with sin. And it's like that's a that's not a worthy sacrifice. Read go read Exodus and Leviticus. The differences between the sac the worthy sacrifice and the unworthy sacrifice. There was a clear delineation. Again, you're going to see this, especially the later on you get in the Bible. Jesus Christ was the worthy lamb that was slain. Okay. As was appointed to be the powerful son of God, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So Romans 8, 12, spoiler alert. So then brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In John 3, 30, uh, 335, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Uh, for reference on this, and I want you to do a little bit of homework, read Daniel 7 and read Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, and try to put all that together and hit me up. Through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the Gentiles. Again, this is great commission stuff. Each of us, if you believe, trust, obey Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, some 2,000 years ago, has already commissioned you and me to go and do this. Look. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of age. Mark 16, starting at verse, uh, let me jump ahead. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe it will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who would believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. And if they drink anything deadly, they will not harm them. There, I would say, like, is that literal? I wouldn't say so, even though it did kind of happen to Paul. Um, and you're going to read this in Acts. Um, later on in Acts. Um, what this means is that our physical lives are... Those, that's not where life is. Our spiritual life unto God, that's where life is. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. So in Luke 24, again, after the uh, road to Emmaus, um, he asks, why are you in trouble? And why do your doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet and that it is I myself touch me and see me. And then he goes on to say, this is commission. Though these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses in the prophets and the Psalms. Sorry, I'm a little burpy must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead to the third day. Guess what? He fulfilled that. And repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I'm sending you what my father promised, the Holy Spirit. As for you, stay in the city until you're empowered from on high. And then on right before in Acts, right before he ascends, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times of period that the father has set by his own authority. But guess what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, including you who are also called in Christ Jesus. Consider this, the promise of Isaac in Genesis 17, the calling of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, the calling of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, or even the calling of Paul in Acts 9. Ultimately, Romans 8, we know that all things work together for the good of those who are who love God and who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And for those whom he called, he also justified. And for those who justified, he also glorified. My entire point is this. Paul says, this is including you who are also called by Christ Jesus. But we look at this. And we look at the last line in this passage. For those who pre let's let's do this is a mathematical equation. Don't don't skip if you don't like math, you're not good with math, don't skip out on me. This will be real simple. For those he predestined, look, he also glorified. For those who he set his affections before uh, the foundation of the earth was set, he will also save. For those who are called by Jesus Christ, if you are called by Christ, you will be saved. If you are called, you are justified. If you are justified, you are then glorified. And look at this. Notice notice that this is not present tense. Why how was this a mistake then on Paul's part? Like, did he get the, the verb tense wrong? No, he didn't. Because Jesus Christ, what he did, he did perfectly. And because he is God. That glorification, it's, already, it's a done deal. Now, in our perspective, we don't see that just yet. We don't see the glorification of bro our brothers and sisters yet. But because it's God who op operates outside of time, who cannot lie and cannot break promises, but he only keeps promises, that's a done deal. The salvation of God's people is a done deal. It was a done deal from the cross of Christ. And what's really going to blow your mind, which we're going to get into in Romans 3, is that the cross of Christ secured the salvation for those who lived before the cross of Christ. We'll get to that in a second. 
to all who are in Rome, loved by God, and called us saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Compare the love for the world versus the tender, affectionate, personal, relational love that God has for his people. For those who believe and trust in him, those who are called saints, this is his greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. My takeaway about God in this whole passage is that all the promises of God are yes and amen. If you see the magnitude of promises, the depth of promises, the, the, the sheer number of promises that God makes throughout all scripture, and he just is just fulfilling all those promises, 2 Corinthians 1.20, for every one of God's promises is yes in him. Therefore, through him, we can also say yes. Amen to the glory of God. But here's the, here's the thing. I'm going to speak to those who grew up charismatic, who grew up with prophetic words, who are meant, those prophetic words were meant to be encouragement. Uh, there, there's a promises that you might have heard that, that have it come true, but I'm going to have your sight. Don't set your sights on, on the prophetic word. Set your sights on the word of God that, Ultimately, we are to test all those prophecies against the word of God and see if they come to light. So where do you see God in the text? What does the text say about God? All those promises in the Old Testament, I started in Genesis 3.15. And through the law, through the prophets, through the songs, through the wisdom, all culminating that God will save his people. In other words, and to ask me how many times, go and figure out how many times you read this throughout all the scripture. We will be his people and he will be our God. So here's the gospel proclamation. John three sixteen: for God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, there's always a, a separation. The world is saying that there's a middle ground. There's a neutral area. Um, the certain religion uh, systems in the world, Catholicism, Mormonism, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they they will say, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's people who are saved and people who are not saved. But there's also this gray, murky, mushy, gooey, ooey, uh, soft-centered, uh, neutral area. No, 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 no. Read the Bible. You can say God is in his grace and mercy. There are two, there are two paths. We see John 3 16 that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? Well, what about those who don't believe? Okay, just stay in John 3. Yeah. We we know John 3 16. We see it in football. We see it, you know, we see it in ads, we see it in all that. But well, just read a little bit. Read to the end of the chapter and we'll just find out what happens to those who do not believe and trust and obey Christ. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. We get that. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. The CSB calls that rejection. The ESC will say disobeys. So you wrestle that accordingly. So here's our responsibility. Hey, guess what? You see this section right here when you're talking about responsibility, it's going to it's going to sound like a a beat I'm beating your drum. Why? Because this is the only thing you can take out from this. Our here's our call, trust in God alone. Yeah, I guess guess what? Next week it's probably going to be the same thing. Trust in God alone. Obey God. Believe in Christ. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. It's going to be I'm going to beat this drum. And you may be saved, you may be a Christian, you already believe, but I believe, and I think you do too, that you have to hear the gospel proclamation week in, week out. Let's be honest, day in and day out. Theologically, we know that God does not lie. But how do we know that to be sure? His written word is the transcript of all his promises. More so is the transcription of his heart. Now, some of the things in the Bible are too difficult for us to understand and some too mysterious. That is okay. Because what we do have is his son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And even the most hardcore atheist would be foolish to deny the historical life of Jesus Christ. And that is happening. 
we can revise history all day long. Say Jesus Christ didn't wasn't even born. He was just a made up dude. No, he wasn't a made up dude. He was historically, he was a very much a real person. But Christ was not merely a historical marker that changed all of mankind's history. He came so that he completely, uh, definitely, perfectly fulfilled one thing to save his people from their sins forever. Here's our responsibility. Trust in God and nothing else on this earth. Remember that Him let the things of the earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm going to put it in another way. Um, John Owen from the book, The Glory of Christ. On Christ's glory, I will fix all of my thoughts and desires. And the more I see of the glory of Christ, the more the painted beauties of this world wither in my eyes, and I will be more and more crucified to this world. It will become to me like something dead and putrid, impossible for me to enjoy. And that's my prayer for you. I pray that you will fix your eyes and as imperfectly as that could be through bleared eyes, through, you know, it's like, man, I can barely make out the glory of Christ. I hope we fix our eyes, fix our hearts, fix our minds upon him, fix our lives upon him. And here's my prayer. You have given me the commandment to follow you, to obey you, to listen to your voice, to heed your prophecy, to take you at face value, to take you at your word and to honor you, to worship you, to love you with everything in me. But God, I will need to be created like new to have a completely different heart your, that your spirit to replace my missing one. And not just a changed mind or a renewed mind, but a renewed mind. A righteousness, not my own holiness, so that I'm so distant from a grace that's layer upon more grace. A mercy that is new every morning. A love that never ceases. An adoption that calls me your own. And a romance that makes you my beloved. And I'm going to need you, the only God who alone is mighty to save. So today... Your promise is that if I go to you and you, I ask for God, you're going to give me God. So, Lord, give me you. Amen. Hope you enjoy this. Uh, catch us, and I just got these done. Catch us at twitch.theologic.us. You can also catch us at youtube.theologic.us. So you don't have to memorize that You know, weird. Just go there, click, follow, subscribe, whatever. And um, so you don't miss an episode. Uh, we will be back. And on Wednesday, that is 5 p.m. Central, we're going to start our series on the meditations of the pastoral epistles. I hope you join us later.